Whistler and Blackcomb Mountains. Avalanche control is an important part of the patroller's job. It's also complex and dangerous. Most of the work is done by hand and the patrollers have to put themselves right above the slide path. Weather is also a concern. In these coastal mountains, things can change in minutes. One minute you can feel like you're on top of the world and everything's in its place, and the next minute uh, the things can change, the weather can come in on you, the wind can come. Without visibility, you, you don't know exactly where you are at all times. And uh, you have to be pretty confident in your, your own bearings and having been in each place before and knowing where to go and where not to go because uh, things uh, can start to accumulate pretty quickly and uh, you can get yourself into trouble as well as your partner. You've got a pack full of explosives that you have to, uh, you have to be safe with and uh, you have to be able to get yourself out safely as well as your partner. So uh, a lot of times, you know, the weather will come in, things slow down, you take a few deep breaths, you uh, get your bearings and you carry on. You're very exposed, uh, you can't see the edge of the cornice, uh, you know, the, the thought is always in the back of your mind that you're just going to take that step out into space and fall. Uh, and even worse, trigger an avalanche and get caught in it. But you know, you can call me twisted if you like. I love being up there in a howling blizzard. I, I just, you just feel, you're there. You're so there with, with the mountain. It's, it's howling. It's real. Avalanches are the deadliest of mountain hazards. One minute you're on top of the world, suddenly, without warning, your world changes dramatically. Knowing the snowpack in your area is the key to avalanche forecasting and avalanche avoidance. In the morning, when the alarm wakes me up at about 6.05 in the morning, and the first thing I usually do is look out the window because you can tell a lot just by looking at the window. I've got a good view of the area here. You want to see how, where the cloud level is, what kind of sky you've got, you know, obviously whether there's precipitation. Yeah, everything, every morning you have to take a run at what the avalanche conditions are going to be like for, the day, for that particular day. Uh, a lot of it depends on what, what the weather was like overnight. How much new snow you had is one of the most important things. How much wind, where the wind come from, what are the temperatures up high, uh, but also what's happened in the past. Uh, so if there's a particular weak layer in the snow that you've been following, you always got to ask yourself, well, what's that weak layer likely to do today? Hetherington has been working in these mountains since 1967. At one time, he was the head of the Whistler Pro Patrol and was involved in developing the avalanche control strategy for the mountain. His experience as a pro patroller has paid off. His heli ski company has a perfect safety record. Very often if there's an avalanche, somebody failed to recognize that there was a weak layer in the snow and went into an area where obviously they shouldn't have gone. Uh, then how do you find those weak areas? Weak layers becomes a matter of technique and practice and training and, and uh, whether people have actually looked or not. Well, if you're going to be in the snow, in the mountains, on a daily basis, like we are when we're heli skiing, uh, you really have to get to the, know your snowpack and you want to get to know it early. Uh, you don't get into the snow until there is some snow, so you want to get in there usually late November, early December around Whistler when we start to accumulate our snow and find out what exactly is going on in the snowpack. Uh, you get a, at that time of year you want to dig a fair amount of a, quite a number of snow profiles. Uh, you want to check all the different aspects. You want to do snow, pile, snow profiles to the ground. You want to do snow profiles uh, at various elevations and uh, certainly for our purposes we want to do snowpack uh, or snow profiles uh, in an area where there's uh, glacial ice down at the bottom of the snowpack so you can tell what's going on at the interface between the, 
glacial ice in the bottom of the snowpack because it changes every year. If you want to get to know the snowpack in your area, you have to dig down deep and bury yourself in your work. So I kicked the screen down. I can feel a bit of a stiffer layer from last night when it was warmer. And then I'm hitting a bit of a softer layer. I mark that off, carrying on down through the snow. OK, so one of the most important things when you're looking at the layers is the hardness test. This is something you do first off. You want to just see how the hardness compares from layer to layer. And the thing I'm looking for is if I see any soft layers sandwiched in between harder layers, which I actually do here, there's a stiffer layer from last night that came with the warm temperatures. And underneath it is a bit of a softer layer that came probably last week when the, the weather was a bit cooler, the snow was a bit fluffier. And with the cool temperatures, it didn't have a big chance to settle out. So it's sandwiched in between some harder layers. So looking at this, I can see that this soft layer might turn out to be a bit of a problem for us later when we get more of a load of snow on top. It might be a failure layer, a cause of perhaps some avalanching. The next thing I want to be doing is actually look at the crystals here to see what, what they actually are, what type of snow. I can see that the snow that fell last night is settling rapidly. You don't really see much evidence of snowflakes anymore. So as snow settles and starts rounding, the layer becomes harder. There's less air in it, less fluffy. But when I go down to this other bit of a softer layer that I defined here, have a look at those crystals. You can still see some snowflake shapes in there. Some indications that this layer isn't or hasn't settled as quickly as the warmer layer above it. So settlement usually happens pretty quickly around, around here just because of the warmer temperatures we have. When you look at the snowpack, say out in an area where the, the temperatures are consistently cooler, say out in the Rockies, you'll probably find a lot more soft layers and layers buried deep down in the snow where you can actually still see uh, defined snow crystals. But as I was saying around here, our snowpack settles pretty quickly, which is something we're glad to have. This information is shared with the public. Local papers, Snow phones and the internet have snowpack conditions and avalanche hazard ratings for most areas. Good morning. How are you doing there, Dan? It's Dan calling from Whistler Mountain. I've got some of our observations here this morning for you. Okay, currently up at 1835 meters, we've got... Search and rescue teams use this information to help them in the field. If avalanche hazard is high, they will take extra precautions and try to avoid some areas. There's an old saying in the mountains among the backcountry fraternity that states, the avalanche doesn't know you're an expert. Even the pros can get fooled and swept away in a slide. We were going out um, evaluating our results from the gun that day and we had a post control release as I was doing some ski cutting and I got caught in an avalanche and sent for a real good ride. And uh, at, so, so at a couple of points during the course of the slide, I was buried completely, but I managed to, when things started to slow down, I just kept struggling and I, I popped out on the surface, but I hyperextended both my knees in the course of the avalanche and uh, had to have knee surgery a few years later as a result. What was going through your mind when you were riding the slide? <laughs> Sounds like it was a pretty hairy one. Uh, yeah, it was pretty wild. Uh, oh, the, I don't know, there's a, a, a thousand and one thoughts going all at once. I mean, uh, you're totally disoriented. Um, it was darkness, sky blue, sky blue, darkness thrown in between when I was totally buried and then finally struggling, basically just struggle, Let's fight for survival is the main thing. I, I've got to get out of here, I'm going to get out of this thing and um, sure enough I did, but not quite unscathed. <laughs> People involved in search and rescue will tell you that carrying a peeps probe and shovel is just the beginning. 
You have to learn how to use them if you're going to save your partner's life. So, Andrew, a few points about learning how to use a peeps. Uh, number one thing, beginning of the season, make sure you've got fresh batteries in there. We're at, uh, a few Cold years ago, a friend of mine was in Blackcomb Glacier, had uh, finished off his uh, level one avalanche course and um, uh, lent a peeps to someone he just met, had no experience with it. And uh, my friend was buried in an avalanche and the other fellow couldn't get him out because he didn't know how to use the peeps. So that was a case of maybe not selecting the right partner to be with. And then the next thing is, is turning it on. Okay, so this is uh, these uh, peeps, it's a 457. This is the frequency that is now used internationally. Okay, so this is the only frequency that you should be using. You turn it on. Okay, this one is on already. Okay, you've got yours on, good. Okay, with this uh, dial in the down position, you are transmitting, you're sending a signal out. Now, when I lift this up, I'm getting your signal. Okay, so there's a couple of different techniques uh, for finding a peeps. One is the induction method. Um, the system I like to use is called uh, the grid search. And uh, basically what you're doing is you're using a grid pattern for your search. So I'm going to start over here. Your peeps is off now, Andrew? Okay, so I'm going to try and find the strongest signal. Okay, this is it here. I'm going to follow this. Signal's getting stronger. It's very strong here. And now it's petering out. I'm going to keep my peeps pointing the exact same direction. I'm going to turn around. And when I get to the loudest point, I'm going to turn it down till I can just hear it. Now I'm going to go in the other direction. Oh, it's petered out here. I'm going to come back. Okay, getting my strongest signal. Fades away here. Fades away here. There it is. So you should be finding someone in a search in under five minutes and under three. Uh, best for a uh, single burial and we're trying to find a double burial within five minutes. Um, usually um, you have about seven minutes total time before, uh, before you lose someone if there's uh, no air pocket at all. And people have been found in air pockets uh, uh, in over half an hour. You have up to 20 minutes. I found someone alive in 25. But uh, best chances are for the speediest recovery possible. So practice a lot with this. That's the most important thing about using a peeps is practicing. Time. In search and rescue, time is the critical factor. If a person is buried in an avalanche and can't breathe, there is very little time, as little as seven minutes. Dogs have been used for years by police and other professionals in ground searches. They are relatively new to the mountains of North America. Uh, a dog team can search an area of one hectare in size with a, a core search in 30 minutes and a fine search, depending on the nature of the train, of course, uh, in one to two hours. And in comparison, a, a probe line uh, made up of people in steel probes in order to search that area, um, a course probe would take uh, three to four hours and a fine search would take upwards of 20 hours. So there's a, a big difference in time there. We've done tests. We've had races with peep, with trained patrollers looking for peeps, and uh, 
quite frequently, nine out of ten times, actually, the dog will find the peeps before the person with the peeps uh, set on receive does. So the dog's pretty quick. Arms. With a, an avalanche dog, we like to start them. Well, depends on the dog's maturity, but some can start at nine months. Some have to be a year before they can handle the training process. But we start out by uh, holding holding the young dog back, and the master will all run away about uh, I don't know 30 meters and go into a hole, an open hole, like a cave or something like that, and then. The person that's holding the dog is encouraging the dog as the master's running away, like, where'd you go, where'd you go, go find her, where is she, where is she? And just holding her so the dog's getting wound up. And then as soon as the master's hidden, the handler lets the dog go and says, search. So every time that happens, the dog hears, search. So we're actually today, we're doing a tree well search, which um, we've been called out to, Cisco and I've been called out to a couple which haven't ended up too well, but uh, people do get, people around here do get caught in tree walls. And that's just another facet of our training that we train for. The agonizing thing about search and rescue is that all too often, the teams are recovering dead bodies. Just a month before this interview, Yvonne and Cisco recovered a snowboarder who had fallen into a tree well. He was just outside the ski area boundary, but he was by himself and no one heard his cries for help. It's the second victim Cisco has recovered in two years. You always want them to be alive, <clears throat> but uh, you just see a hope, but then you realize that they're not. But the only thing that we can be, it's really good. You know, it cuts the search time down for, you know, they've had, uh, you know, the girl that was up in Worcester Bowl, she was up there for, gosh, what was it, almost a year her body was up there, and her parents were just, you know, so hard on them. And there's another guy over at Black Home, it's three weeks he was missing. And just, it's, so the only way you can look at it, that it's easier on the family. It's still really horrible and tough on everybody, but it's easier on the family if, you know, they know instead of just figuring out. Because the dog will, will find the victims quicker. Yeah. Yeah, instead of, you know, them melting out in the spring and stuff like that. Is everyone out? You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. But is there anybody under? I, uh, one girl. Where? Yeah, she's all right. We got here. This is a bad day in the mountains. Three people in a heli ski group are buried beneath this avalanche. Their guide watched helplessly from the bottom as the slope he had skied minutes before broke away. The group is only a few kilometers from the Whistler Blackcomb area, and rescue workers are on the scene in minutes. The people trapped under the snow are all wearing peeps. But this is a huge slide, and it takes time to find them. The clock is ticking. Everyone works furiously. Yes, right here. Yes, 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 yes. Shovel up. Adventure, drama, 
Most of us satisfy our craving for adventure vicariously through our television in the safety and comfort of our living rooms. This is reality. These people put themselves in difficult situations. They challenge themselves. They don't like to talk about why they do it, and you won't hear them brag about lives they have saved. Maybe it's because they know that one day it could be them that needs to be rescued. It could be them under the snow. This is a bad day in the mountains. The three people are dead. They never had a chance. They were crushed beneath the weight of the snow. The back country around here, it's totally open. Once you leave the back country, you're on your own and you're allowed to access the back country. Whereas some spots in the States and in the Banff area, you're not allowed to access the, the out of bounds. So we want to keep that access totally open. So we'll try and inform people going out there the best we can as to what the conditions are and try and encourage them to be uh, well equipped for what they might encounter out there. No, they should have rescue gear, should have a bit of knowledge, and they should at least know the terrain. But uh, these days we're getting a lot of people out there now that really aren't very well equipped and are just maybe following tracks or following someone who's been out there once before. And Well, if people are going outside of the area boundary, they need to realize that they are on their own and uh, self-rescue is, is critical. They need to be able to have confidence in the other members of their party. So they all need to have a, a certain level of experience and training. And that would be in uh, route finding and, and avalanche uh, hazard assessment. So there's, there's lots of courses out there and, uh, that are available for these people. So as far as equipment goes, an avalanche transceiver, a beacon, uh, a good shovel, a collapsible probe, um, and then if they're going for extended trips, then of course they need to get into uh, you know, more survival gear, food, shelter, and that sort of thing. It's also important that, that they let uh, someone know back home where they're going and when they're expected back. And that person, of course, would notify uh, search and rescue or the mountain and, uh, if, if they didn't show up on time. The equipment that they carry do doesn't prevent an avalanche. It doesn't prevent them getting caught in an avalanche. I mean, that's, that's the training. But uh, one thing, if they have to expose themselves to an avalanche prone slope, uh, they'll do so carefully, one at a time. So that if there is a, um, a burial, then the other members of the party can uh, go and dig them out and find them quickly. I think the main thing to do for trying to find, uh, uh, do things right in, in the backcountry is just to be really aware of what's going on uh, with the snow. and also know your limitations and your your ambitions and uh, and understand all how those three points interact there's always of course the the chance that uh, something will go wrong and all your possibilities that uh, have been exhausted in that case well the shit's just hitting the fan and you got to deal with it and it's not fun but uh, it kind of is in a sense and, and we all have to make our calls to how much risk we want to take and why we go out there but uh, you gotta do what you have to.